Welcome back to the studio and to my custom palette building series. In this series, I am guiding you through creating your own custom watercolor palette. As an example, I am creating my own custom watercolor palette, this enameled metal watercolor palette, which I am bringing with me to Australia when I travel in about a week. In the previous two episodes, I guided you through choosing your first six colors. First, I created a cyan, magenta, and yellow primary triad, which already allows you to mix a wide range of bright and saturated colors, as you can see in this diagram. Next, I guided you through choosing secondary and complementary colors, which allow you to not only mix even brighter colors around the color wheel, but also to mix some neutral colors by mixing colors with their complementary color. Here you can see the first six colors that I chose. While I can, of course, mix dark and neutral tones, if I have more than six colors available to me, I do prefer to include some dark and neutral tones. So in this video, I'm going to show you how I go about choosing dark and neutral colors. First, let's talk about dark colors. Like m many artists, I would not recommend choosing a pure black pigment for your dark colors because that can be hard to control and can make some very dull mixes. However, a number of convenience mixes of dark colors as well as some dark pigments do exist. Here are three examples. First, here is an indigo. This is a mix of a few pigments. It is a dark, deep blue, which is useful for shadow colors. You can also find more neutralized versions, often called Payne's Gray or Neutral Tint. You can also choose a darker, more muted version of one of the pigments already on your palette, like this Thio Indigo Violet PR88. Um, this isn't a very light fast pigment, but it is a beautiful violet color. Many artists also choose a combination of pigments, a signature gray mix. Jane Blundell, who is an artist who I really admire, frequently uses a mix of PB29 Ultramarine Blue and PBR7 um, Burnt Sienna to create this gray tone, which she uses pre-mixed in her palette. Now let's take a look at the dark colors that I prefer to use. I guess this is the Lee and Gold signature mix. So here, I'm gonna show you what I do. So here I have a pan and I have two watercolor paints. And you're gonna see I'm about to cheat a little with my 15 pans because I'm gonna put two paints in one pan. I'm not going to mix them. I am just going to use I'm just going to fill both sides so that I can easily mix them with a swipe of a brush, but I can also use them separately. So that's what the pan looks like filled up. And now I'll do a little bit of swatching. So. The two colors that I have in my split pan are two perylenes, a perylene violet, PV29, and a perylene green, PBK31. The perylene violet is a very reddish, but also extremely muted, dark violet color. You can see here it's like somewhere between a burgundy and maroon and more of a violet tone. The perylene green is actually so dark and so muted that 
its color index is actually a black, it's a PBK31, but you can see that it is still clearly a green color, um, although it is very dark and very muted. I find both of these colors useful together and on their own for mixing all kinds of shadow colors, so I'm going to show you some examples now. First, I'm going to show you what I most frequently use this PV29 for, which is mixing with reds. Now, I have not included a red like this PR178 in this palette, but you can see how it creates these deep, shadowy red burgundy colors when mixed with PR178. It does a similar thing when mixed with transparent orange, which I have included in this palette creating a range of earthy, muted, orange shadow tones. PV29 also does a surprisingly good job of creating shadows even for magenta colors, even though it is technically somewhat warmer than my magenta choice. It creates an interesting range of violets when mixed with PV16, although you'll see here that I've made a little bit of a mistake and I've accidentally mixed it with PV60 first. So let me just correct that. So first I mixed it with my Indian Throne Blue and you can see that it makes like this deep dark purpley black and then with PV16 it does make uh, more of a violet We'll see that in a moment, see? But still very, very neutral. It's an interesting color for underpainting on its own for PY150, which is my yellow tone. Um, and when mixed with the green on my palette, PG36, Thalo Green Yellow Shade, it creates, again, a range of grays. Now looking at the other side, this is PBK31, and you can see these deep, dark, beautiful teals with PB16. I haven't yet found a great subject for using these mixes on, but boy are they ever beautiful. These might be some of my favorite colors, even though they don't really frequently come up in any of my paintings. PBK31 is not only a useful shadow color, it also creates a wide, wide range of mossy greens when mixed with my yellow PY150. PBK31 is of course also a useful shadow color for other greens like this PG36. You can see this range of interesting forest greens that you can create with this little green yellow shade and PBK31 Paraline Green. Finally, you can mix it with its complement, which is a red. Once again, here is PR178 Paraline Red which is, when I include a red in my palette, this is more often than not the red I include, and you can see how it neutralizes PBK31 nearly perfectly. So you can create very, very deep shadow colors using this green and a red. Finally, let's see what these two colors look like mixed together. So this is Paraline Violet mixed with Paraline Green, and you can see that while they don't actually, they're not perfectly across from each other on the color wheel, because they are both so dark and they are close to complements, they create an interesting range of grays, deep greens, purples, and sort of bluey violets all across the spectrum. This very, very nice, subtle range. And here, they are mixed together, you can see. Next, let's take a look at some earth tones. This is a different kind of muted color that's useful to have in your palette. So there's a wide range of natural earth tones available. These tend to be granulating, which can add some interesting texture to your work. 
Um, they are also largely in well earth colors. They're muted oranges and yellows, browns. So you can see there's quite a range in the sort of more yellow shade between yellow ochres, raw sienna, uh, more brown ochres. And then there's also more reddish tones like burnt sienna. Um, you can also see that there's a wide range in transparency. While many earth tones are semi-transparent or transparent, some, like this Venetian red, are completely opaque. You can also have some very dark earth tones, like a raw umber. Many companies recently have started offering natural um, mineral paints like hematite. So here I've actually got two different versions of hematite and you can see how the same mineral can look very different um, depending on where it's sourced. Uh, there's no way I could cover all of the different earth tones that are available, but here are some. The section at the top of the page is all traditional earth colors made with natural earth pigments and in natural earthy tones that you would associate with earth colors. However, there are other earth tone options. So first of all, you can choose colors that are muted, granulating versions of other colors that you would not necessarily associate with earth tones like pinks and greens. And there are also a number of synthetic pigments um, from modern chemistry, which are not granulating, but are the traditional earthy colors. So here, for example, is a pink granulating color, which could maybe be considered an earth tone, and also a natural ground stone, green apatite genuine, which is nothing that I would usually call an earth tone, but could also be considered an earth tone depending on your choices. Finally, we have these modern, transparent, non-granulating, earthy colors. Um, here are three quinacridones, quinacridone gold, quinacridone burnt orange, and quinacridone sienna, PR206. And you can see that these have the same hue as some of the natural earth tones but they don't granulate, which could make them useful for portraits, botanical art, or other cases where you want to render very smooth subjects. Finally, let's take a look at my choices. So for this palette, I chose a Spanish gold ochre, which is a paint that I mulled myself. This is a semi-opaque, warm, golden color and then a Van Dyke Brown by Roman Schmal Aquarius, which is a very deep, dark, coffee brown color with a pronounced granulation, which is something that I'm looking for in this particular palette, although I don't always want granulation in my paints uh, because this palette is going to be used primarily for sketching. I do want some texture. You can see how dark I can get with that. Finally, let's see how these all fit into my finished palette. So here is my previous six color choices. Um, and as you can see, they're spread out around the color wheel. Now I'm going to fill in the colors I just added. So first, I'm deciding how I'm going to do this. And then I'm just going to mix it right in, actually. So here are some of the mixes that I can make. So first here is Perlene Violet. And then down in the middle of that circle, I've mixed it with the Perlene Green. And then over on the other side, I've got Perlene Green. and I've mixed it across and you can see how I can make some deep dark neutrals with that. Mm -hmm. 
Now, very helpfully, <laughs> while painting my earth colors, I uh, moved my color wheel out of frame a little bit. Um, so, I'm still getting used to my overhead rig. I'm very sorry about that, but I will show you at the end how this all looks put together. And once again, as in previous episodes, I'm curious to hear from you what dark and earth colors do you include in your palette? Let me know down in the comments below, and don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you'd like to see more of this content. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!